through mediation, biology to the rescue. It sounds like a snazzy idea, but it has been around ever since there has been life on Earth. If it weren't for bioremediation, we'd all be sitting on mountains of dinosaur poop. <laughs> right now, at this very minute, Mother Nature's little helpers are cleaning up after dead and decaying plants and animals and natural phenomena like volcanoes and fires and earthquakes. Without people, Earth is perfectly capable of healing itself over time. But the tipping point is we are overwhelming nature's capacity to bioremediate itself. If only we could put a continent or two aside for a millennium or two, then we would be just fine. That's not happening. In many cases, we have ruined the environment with good intentions. Let's take the example of DDT. Paul Hermann Mueller received the 1948 Nobel Prize in Medicine for DDT. This pesticide had a huge impact on public health by bringing down incidents of malaria and cholera globally. But just 15 years later, through a simple book, Silent Spring, Rachel Carson reported that indiscriminate spraying of supposedly beneficial chemicals was hurting the environment. DDT was poisoning the songbirds and the spring season was silenced. Another example closer to home is MTBE, methyl, tertiary, butyl, ether. It was added as a fuel oxygenate to gasoline to mitigate air pollution. And indeed, it helped clean Los Angeles air quality, but ended up contaminating our water resources. Good intentions gone awry continue to occur today. I'm an engineer who has a lot of experience solving tough problems, but I'm also an inquisitive scientist who perpetually asks even tougher questions. What can we do to care for our environment sustainably? And that's where bioremediation comes in. We can help nature clean up nature faster naturally. I've been using nature-inspired biotechnologies to clean up the environment for about 18 years now. You can say now I'm an adult in this business. <laughs> Every time I would give a talk, speak with students, present a paper, I made a case for why we should remove toxic chemicals from the environment. I would talk about it in a very detached manner. Carcinogens, endocrine disruptors, toxicants, very academic terms. And it was all academic, until it wasn't. A few years ago, I was diagnosed with cancer. Now it was personal. To me, it's more important than ever to research ways to protect our society and our children's future against the poisons we ourselves are putting in the environment. Now, I'm not saying that we should reverse the advances of modern technology, which has indeed improved the quality of our life, but we must move forward in harmony with nature. And to do that, we must begin at the smallest forms of life on our planet, microbes. We need to switch our thinking about microbes from ew to wow, because they're awesome. Every food web and every food chain on Earth begins with bacteria. They have crucial roles in producing food, decomposing waste, and performing many ecosystem services. Without them, we won't be able to eat, breathe, or live. They're invisible, but found everywhere on the planet. Even human bodies. Healthy human bodies have more microbes than human cells, and that's our personal microbiome. In my research, we discover and engineer bacteria that are relevant for the protection and restoration of the environment. We design monitoring tools which help validate naturally occurring processes. We also figure out methods in which we can stimulate, augment, and accelerate remediation timeframes. And finally, we predict and manage environmental microbiome 
for long-term success. In my lab, we take one of the two approaches. Sometimes we bring the environment into the lab, study what works out there, and refine the solutions. Or we develop the technology in the lab first, and then test it out in the real world. One of the, my research areas addresses 1,4-dioxane. It's an industrial solvent that's suspected to cause cancer. It's found in trace amounts even in personal care products like soaps and shampoos. And dioxane has been detected in water supplies across the US and around the world. Beginning in my PhD research and continuing to this day, my colleagues and I have identified dozens of bacteria that can convert 1,4-dioxane into harmless carbon dioxide and water. I still remember my first microbial characterization was so exciting. I even learned a little bit of Latin, so I could give it a nice name, Pseudonocardia dioxanivorans, because <laughs> this Pseudonocardia devours dioxane. I studied it from many angles so I could figure out all its qualities almost like creating a dating profile for this micro. <laughs> now we know which enzymes are responsible for dioxane bioremediation, how we can speed up reaction times in complex mixtures, and how bioremediation can be combined with other technologies like charcoal and electrochemical and many nanotechnologies so that everything works well, we have sustainable long-term success, and a desirable environmental microbiome. Working together with other professors and environmental engineers, we've been able to take our research out of the lab into the field where we've helped demonstrate this technology and also helped change the industrial and governmental perception that bioremediation can be a viable, economical, and safe option for dioxane and many other water pollutants. Another class of contaminants that I research are called per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, PFASs. They're used in the manufacture of a lot of products that we use even in our homes. Things like clothing, insulation, and nonstick pans. Everything that just turned red in this kitchen probably contain some PFASs. PFASs are also used in firefighting foams. You might ask, what could possibly be wrong with something that puts out fires and saves lives? Turns out, some of these PFASs are implicated in causing cancer, cardiovascular disease, and birth and developmental effects. My students and I are studying fungi and fungal enzymes that are normally used for rotting wood in nature to study bioremediation of these PFASs. We've had some early successes and lots of challenges. When we collected soil and water from contaminated sites, we found that there were fungi active in those niches. In all, we collected about 1,200 different isolates, and so far, only six of them have worked well. This gorgeous bunch. They've been able to degrade some of the PFAS precursors all the way down to complete detoxification. And then some others have able to transform some PFASs, at least up to the point where other bacteria and other environmental processes can completely convert them down into nature's building blocks. Look, perseverance and trial and error are necessary ingredients of the scientific process. We must not get discouraged, but continue exploring natural and enhanced bioremediation, because remember, everything is eventually biodegradable. It just needs time and the right microbiome. So if I could leave you with one thing, it would be this. When the Earth is sick, it's like when we are sick. I had some symptoms, I did clinical tests, took strong medicines, surgery even, and all that came with side effects. By focusing the treatments with diet and lifestyle changes, 
we can have a wholesome microbiome and long-term health. Similarly, the earth needs treatment with minimal side effects. Bioremediation can be that treatment in which microbes can provide the medicine for successful and sustainable future, but they can also be serving as boosting ecological immunity against further deterioration. Thank you.